The Tom Woods Show, episode 627. Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. Gang, if you want to learn the formula for how to set up and execute a successful email campaign to increase your sales, then check out the resources Daniel Levis has got up. He's doing a couple of Encore webinars this week, the week of March 28, 2016, and then he's taking it all down. So check it out at tomwoods.com slash Daniel and give yourself an unfair advantage over your competitors. tomwoods.com slash Daniel. Hi, everybody. Tom Woods here. Eric Peters joins us once again. Because I'm in a car mood today, we're going to talk about cars and government policy, usually a toxic mix. And Eric is the best guy to talk to because he's sound on all issues. He's politically sound, and he's sound to the point of view of automobiles. He's a great person to talk to. As you know, if you've heard him on the show in the past, he runs epautos.com. That stands for Eric Peters. So epautos.com is definitely a site you're going to want to check out. Stay tuned after my conversation with Eric because I got a really nice freebie for you guys today. So stay tuned for that. Eric, welcome back. Good to be back, Tom. Let's see. I Basically, I have you on every once in a while, because, and then we, we go over what you've been doing. And it's all new stories. It's all fresh stuff that I don't know about. And also, you keep on top of stories that are in the headlines for a few days, and then they tend to fall out of the headlines. You're always following them. So let's let's start with the the situation facing VW. Let's, let's remind people what that's all about, and then how this affects um, diesel uh, vehicles. Well, Volkswagen was accused by and admitted to, uh, and I put it in air quotes, cheating uh, on the federal government's emissions tests with regard to its diesel engines. Uh, and the fallout from that has been a major federal investigation and potential fines of up to $46 billion, not million, but billion dollars. Uh, and the latest development is that a number of states, uh, five officially, uh, have launched civil litigation on their own that could amount to another gigantic fine. Uh, directed against Volkswagen, that you know, potentially even for a major corporation, a major automaker such as Volkswagen, uh, this could be devastating, um, not only to its current bottom line, but also to uh, the future because it's going to have less money for R&D. This is going to result in people having a very poor image of Volkswagen. And the tragedy is it's much ado about nothing. These cars are not dirty, despite uh, the incessant portrayal by the mainstream media of that. We are talking about fractions of a percent difference on an arbitrary government test. Uh, these cars meet the Euro-spec requirements, which are just different than ours, uh, but they're quite strict, and they have no problem selling the diesels over there. Uh, it just has to do with uh, federal UKZ, to borrow a word from czarist Russia that I like. I like that word, too. <laughs> so, all right. Now, you, you have a piece here, and I want to remind people they should be checking you out at epautos.com, which is frequently updated, and it's always interesting. And plus, I love your punchy writing style. I enjoy reading you. Oh, thank you. You have a piece uh, somewhat related to this, Uncles Great and Small, and here you're talking primarily about the state governments and what they are up to. Yeah, well, right now, and a lot of people aren't aware of this, Volkswagen is not able to sell any. 2016 model year uh, TDI diesel powered vehicles uh, until uh, they come to some sort of an understanding uh, with the federal mafia and the state mafia. Uh, so you've got all these cars that are tied up on the docks and sitting in dealer inventories and not being sold. And you can imagine what that is, what, is, what that's doing to Volkswagen. And more importantly, what is it doing to the American car buyer? Um, Volkswagen was the only major automaker selling uh, a line of affordable diesels. You could get diesel versions uh, of the Golf and of the Beetle and of the Jetta and the Passat. Um, and uh, Jetta uh, TDI cost about $21,000, $22,000. Uh, is the only car company that, that had these vehicles available. All of the other diesel vehicles on the market are high-end expensive cars, Mercedes, BMWs, and so on. Uh, and it's just, it's just a tragedy. These cars are capable of getting 50 miles per gallon and doing it without the elaborate, expensive hybrid technology. And all over, again, uh, a, a just manufactured crisis. So what's the reason behind it? I mean, it, just because VW does something shouldn't, doesn't seem like anything follows from that. Well, it is interesting. You know, one wonders about the motivation behind it. 
Um, and it's, it's interesting to speculate about that. Now, of course, VW is the only major car company that, that sells diesels in this country, and so that did give them a competitive advantage uh, vis-a-vis, uh, for example, General Motors and Ford, uh, Fiat Chrysler, and so on. So who knows whether there was uh, some skullduggery going on there behind the scenes. Um, but more than likely, it was just the usual vengefulness of the federal government, which uh, you know, will, will move heaven and earth to crucify a company over something like this. But, but interestingly, and I, I, I kind of put this out there as a counterpoint, when one of its own mandates, the airbag mandate, for example, results in people being killed, as has happened recently with the, uh, the Takata airbags, which spew shrapnel in people's faces, yeah, then it's okay, you know, or it's downplayed. It's no big deal, you know, because this is official government policy. But when Volkswagen does it, suddenly, you know, um, the hounds have to be unleashed. What's the situation with diesels in other countries then? Well, you know, in, in Europe, um, I think the figure is it's at least 50%. It's about half of the passenger car vehicles and other vehicles uh, that are sold over there are available with diesel engines. Um, give me an example. I, I, a couple of weeks ago, I had the new Ford Escape, which is a small crossover SUV. They sell that in Europe as the Kuga, uh, K-U-G-A, not like Cougar. Um, and it's available with a diesel engine. Almost every vehicle that you can get is available with a diesel engine. That goes for Japanese manufacturers, too. I have an inside source at um, Mazda. This is some inside baseball that you might be interested in. Um, they had announced about two years ago that they were going to bring their Sky D diesel engine to the United States and make it available to models like the uh, Mazda 3 uh, and possibly also their little CX-5, which is a small crossover. But because of all this, this stuff that's been going on, and the bad PR, the hounding by the federal government, Mazda has decided to just take that off, off the market. They're not going to bring it here, but they do sell it in Europe, and of course they do sell it in Asia and other markets across the world. All right, thanks for that, because I, mm-hmm. I was curious, I don't know anything about this, and also because it seems to me that you know sometimes we look at the European policy on something and it's more draconian than the American one, but there certainly are cases, sometimes in, even in, uh, in medicine or in experimental drugs and so on, it's more lenient in Europe than it is in the U.S., and it sounds like that's the case here as well. That is the case. It's, it's more rational, certainly. You can buy a number of diesel-powered vehicles. Uh, in Western European countries, so we're not talking about former Soviet bloc countries here, we're talking about Germany and so on and France, uh, you can buy vehicles that get 60 and 70 miles per gallon um, in Europe, and they're not available here, uh, both having to do with emissions and the other thing that, that, that messes up the market here, uh, the federal government's crashworthiness standards, which make the vehicles so doggone heavy that they're, you know, they're just not particularly fuel efficient. Ah, okay. okay. But yet, on the other hand, the government wants cars to be fuel efficient, so it mandates that too, and then you get super light cars. So it says, well, we don't have super light cars. If you look at the curb weight uh, of uh, vehicles in the subcompact class, if you look at something like uh, even the, you know, the, the, the ridiculous little smart for two car, you look at vehicles like that, um, Honda Civics and so on, these things weigh anywhere from 500 to 1,000 pounds more uh, than their analogs from the 70s and the 80s. Wow, I didn't know that. Yeah. I've been duped on this. Yeah. And so the result of that is that notwithstanding the modern technologies that are available today, the, you know, direct gas injection, uh, variable valve timing, um, the CVT automatic transmissions, dual clutch transmissions, all of these, these advances on the technical front have kind of been negated by the increase in the curb weight such that today the very best gas cars get about 40 something miles per gallon, low 40s. And, you know, you might remember that cars back in the late 70s and the early 80s, you could go out and buy a Chrysler K car or a Renault Le Car or any, a number of several little cars in that category, and they were fully capable of getting better mileage than that without all the technology because they were light. Uh-huh. Okay. Gee. Yep. I didn't re- I really felt like, – because you do hear this once in a while, don't you, that the, the, the federal government is, is imposing these, these standards, and that's making the cars less safe, and there are more accidents, people getting killed more. That was my line that I was uh, I was repeating. Wow. Okay. Well, that, that's an aspect of it as well. You know, these roof crush standards. That's one of the newer requirements that a car be able to its weight must be supported by the roof in the event that it rolls over. And in order to do that, they've installed these girder like uh, the A pillars. Those are the the, the 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 upright girders at the base of each windshield on the left and the right. And then the C pillars in the back and the B pillars to support the car are now massive. If you look at how thick they are, how wide they are relative to what was typical 20 or 30 years ago, it's startling. So the result is that if you do roll your car, yeah, the roof probably won't crush, but now you're probably more likely to roll the car because you can't see what's going on around you anymore. 
Oh, jeez. Oh, my gosh. I, I would, you know, uh, last week I had Christina Hoff Summers on. I gave her two book projects before she was even done talking to me. Mm-hmm. Part of me feels like, but I would not w- wish this on my worst enemy, especially given how difficult publishing is now in terms of competition and everything. But it just seems like you've got a you've got another book in you here, Eric. But oh, I wouldn't I've want to put several. you. In a, <laughs> I just gotta uh, find yeah. the time. I need a clone. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. So, and, and you know, I, I I think of I think of blogs by the way that I visit from time to time where. I'm not a regular reader, but I like what the blog is doing, and I I know that anything I'm looking for is there in the archive of the blog. But I don't want to sit there in front of my computer reading five years worth of archives. Right. I'd glad I'd gladly take an ebook that was basically just a compilation of blog posts with no further commentary. It would be a lot easier on me, and I'd be much more likely to read it. Anyway, I'm not gonna. I keep doing this to people. I'm. It's up to you and your own conscience what you want to do with regard to books. Okay. (laughs) Let's talk instead about uh, another one of your items up at uh, epautos.com. And you're talking about a bubble that you see forming. Yeah. Tell me exactly what the sector is where we're seeing this bubble. Well, this bubble uh, is developing in the uh, the used car market, interestingly enough, hmm. uh, where the percent of loans on used cars that are in default now is at a uh, as at the highest level in 20 years. It's at about 5.16 percent, according to Experian, uh, and that's very alarming. Um, and the reasons for it are very interesting. Um, you might remember the cash for clunker programs uh, of a few years back. Um, what it did was to kind of uh, perform a kind of genocide on affordable used cars. Uh, it used to be that people could go out and pay cash for a you know, perfectly serviceable car that was mechanically solid and reliable, but most of those have been crushed now, courtesy of the government. Um, so in order for people of modest means to be able to afford a used car, they end up having to go into ho- hock and, and take out a loan on these things. Um, and now they're beginning to default on it. And meanwhile... Um, the duration of loans on new cars is now at six percent going to uh, excuse me six years going to seven and even eight years because the cost of new cars has become exorbitant relative to uh, people's income their ability to pay for it uh, and it just looks like the whole house of cards could collapse at any time with massive repercussions throughout the economy what do you think also about I guess this is also a new car issue it seems like the the term of auto loans has just gone completely crazy. Uh, Sixty month loans now, and even even seventy two months. Yeah, they're going to the the new normal is becoming seven years, and they're going to eight in some cases, and even ten years. And the reason for that has to do with the cost. Uh, last year, the uh, transaction price—that's the industry term for what people are paying for a car. The average transaction price of a new car was thirty one thousand dollars and change. That's a lot of money, and if you try and factor that over, say, five years, uh, the monthly payment is so high that most people just can't deal with it. So what do they do? They push it out to six years and then to seven years. And you know the cars keep getting more expensive in part because the government keeps passing one mandate after the next uh, on the cars. Uh, the latest one that's just been announced, I wrote about it a little while ago, is this automated braking technology that they're going to put into all cars within a handful of years. Um, somebody's got to pay for this stuff, it, and it's everybody who buys a new car. And since people's incomes are not keeping up with the cost of the mandates and the cost of all the other things, uh, the only way to make it work uh, is to keep pushing these, uh, the, these loans farther and farther out. But unlike a house, a car is a depreciating asset, and once it gets to about five, six, seven years old, it really starts to plummet in value. So this nexus is being reached where you're going to be owing money more money than the thing is worth, and more and more people are going to find themselves caught up in this, and it's it's just financially not sustainable. I was going to ask you, you do you remember the cash for clunkers policy? But obviously you do. That would have been yeah. purely rhetorical. And the the direct result of that, of course, was to hurt the used car market by at least for buyers anyway, because now there's a smaller supply of cars that people can buy, and everybody has to pay more, and they have to borrow more. Exactly. That's the thing. Um, it, it put a, a, an artificial uh, pressure on, on the entire business. Uh, it eliminated the affordable pay, it, you know, pay for it, uh, cash on the barrel head car, and it pushed people uh, into, you know, into having to take out loans to buy these cars. And since a lot of people simply don't have the, the credit, they don't have the income to support a loan, uh, just as happened in the real estate business, uh, a lot of there, there are now these fly-by-night financing companies out there that will write a loan for almost anybody. Um, so they write them a loan on the car, and of course, a couple months go by, and the guy can't make the loan, and the, the loan gets defaulted on. 
a car gets repoed. And this is this is beginning to bubble up. And you know, the, the more it happens, the worse it's going to get. I really want you to talk about this uh, recent piece, March twenty fourth, a slingshot around Uncle. Because, oh yeah, yeah. I, I like the the line. I'm taking this is maybe a couple paragraphs in. You say, just don't buy a car. Buy a quote motorcycle that just happens to be a car or mm -hmm. close enough to be serviceable as one. Is is this one of these cases where government has created all these regulations and restrictions? So a clever entrepreneur comes up with something that technically abides by them but lets you kind of get away with something? Or is this something that people were going to in develop anyway? No, it's an end run. Um, it's specifically a way so – It is, okay. It's specifically a way – even though they, they won't say this openly, but that's what it is. Uh, you know, this, these, these little three-wheelers, the article that I wrote was about one in particular called the Polaris Slingshot. But there are several manufacturers that are dabbling in this, and others, Ilioi Motors – um, and they, they build vehicles that meet the technical legal definition of a motorcycle. And in that way, uh, they do not have to have things like airbags and backup cameras. They don't have to pass, pass all the federal crashworthiness standards. So they can be very light, they can be very fuel efficient, and they can be very affordable. Um, this particular vehicle that I wrote about, the Slingshot, gets 40 miles per gallon, uh, does 0 to 60 in under 5 seconds, uh, and only costs about 19000 bucks. Have you actually ridden in one? I have had the good luck to ride in one, yes. <laughs> and it's a hoot. Have you driven one? Yes. I mean, I'm looking at the picture of this thing. <laughs> it's made by Polaris, uh, which makes watercraft um, and, and similar types of vehicles like that. And they are uh, available at any motorcycle store that uh, handles Polaris stuff. There's nothing subtle about this thing, by the way. Uh, no. You can't show up to a funeral in this. No, but, but it's pure machine. You know, it harkens back to the time, which I can remember. I'm old enough to remember when cars were about passion and emotion and fun and sex appeal. And, you know, that's, that's what it was all about. Not, forgive me, safety. You know, I remember a time when the only people who were neurotically concerned about safety were people who drove <laughs> Volvos, and it was great. <laughs> I mean, that's fine that there were yeah, Volvos they, for people who wanted they that. that. Great. Right. Yeah. I don't have an issue with that. The problem that I have is that these people who, who you know, are neurotically obsessed with safety, I mean, even the most infinitesimal risk, they're forcing it down everybody else's throat, too, and making us pay for it and buy it, and that's what I object to. I want something like the slingshot. You know, I, I want something like a Lotus Elise. You know, I want a simple, fun car. Yeah, sure. I'm, I'm totally with you. I mean, I'm, I'm not as uh, excited about that stuff as, as, as you are, but it – to me, it just seems like an outrage that people just can't have fun anymore. It, it's a complete outrage. I mean, think about you know Hunter Thompson, one of my favorite writers, blew his brains out because he felt like the, there was just no fun anymore. That was those were his exact words in his suicide note. Oh my! Okay, I actually didn't know that. Yeah, and that's a little bit of an extreme example, but it's true. This society has just become this dreary, fear laden, safety uber alles, safety and security. It's like it's like a, a neurotic Joan Claybrook has somehow infested all of our psyches and, 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 and turned us into these cringing, fearful little people who think they're threats everywhere. Yeah, I know it. And, you know, it maybe there's no connection, but it does put me in mind of a couple of episodes ago when I had Christina Hoff Summers on and we were talking about this crazy, uh, you know, safe space thing where people can't even hear – it's you know we're not talking about making them drive in a vehicle that they might not think is as safe as they'd like it to be. We're talking about they have to maybe hear somebody's idea, yeah, and it's a little different from their idea, and they can't deal with it. Sure. Well, you probably heard you know Jerry Seinfeld says that he will no longer uh, tour college campuses because of exactly that phenomenon. Yeah, they're hopeless. These people are hopeless, and and you get the sense that these are the same people who just want to take everybody's everybody's fun away on everything. Yeah, I don't understand it. I don't, I don't get how this happened. And it happened pretty quickly. It happened over the space of about 25 years. Now, how about this? When, when we talk about uh, – there are a lot of products that when you, when you look at people who are aficionados of that product, they have a libertarian streak to them. Now, is that – when you – you, you must be – you must uh, know a lot of people who – talk about cars, write about cars. Sure. Are they all people who cower before federal regulations, or are they kind of like you, if, if they had to pick? Oh, I'm anomalous. Uh, I'm, I'm kind of like, somehow, I've become kind of like what Brock Yates was back in the 80s, 
Uh, you might remember Brock Yates and, and, and the guys who rode for Car and Driver and Road and Track and who actually you know, were interested in cars and driving fast and having a good time and hated the government, hated the nanny state, hated busybodies, uh, you know, all this henpecky stuff that's going on. Today, most of the automotive journalists uh, are, you know, are clapping heartily, uh, you know, at everything that the government does. And I'm not sure whether they genuinely believe it in, in it or they're doing it because they think it's necessary for their careers. I don't know, but I definitely stick out like a sore thumb. Huh. Well, we're we're glad you're doing it. Uh, t- tell me, just pick a. Let's make this like the potpourri portion of the show. Pick just anything at random because I think probably you and I haven't spoken. I would say it's got to be two months easily, right? It's been, yeah, it's, it's been a little while. Yeah. Yeah. So tell me, tell me something else that's been going on in the world of cars. I don't know anything that's going on in the world of cars till I talk to you. So this is my opportunity to to fill up my tank, so to speak. <laughs> Well, let's see. Um, you know, right now, uh, because of the the, uh, the plummeting of gas prices, there's kind of um, an interesting phenomenon going on with you know the hybrids. Very, very hard to make a case for the hybrid car when gas is a dollar fifty or even a dollar eighty per gallon. And you wonder what's going to happen, not only to the sales of, of hybrids new, uh, but to the resale uh, value of the ones already on the market. Yeah, who's going to spend, you know, I think a Prius's base price is $24,000. Why in the world would you buy one of these things when, you know, you can go out and spend you know, fifteen or $16,000 on an economy car that, you know, gets 40 miles per gallon and, you know, you just saved 8000 bucks or 7000 uh up front. That buys a lot of gas. You know, that actually kind of reminds me of a question I've been wanting to ask you, and I probably have asked you before, and I think I know your answer, yeah. but it has to do with the whole controversy about whether you should buy a new car. Yeah. Now, forget about hybrid or anything else. Should you buy a new car? Should you buy used? And these days, the conventional wisdom, which is probably correct in this case, is that because cars are built so much better than they were 30 years ago when you would be terrified of buying a used car, because you know maybe tomorrow the thing just simply – it conks out and that's it. But these cars will last a very long time, and you're paying you're paying uh, an enormous premium to buy a new car. Should you buy one? Now, my kind of attitude is: I know I'm paying a premium for a new car, mm-hmm. but I still I just like the idea that nobody has soiled this thing. I, I like I just like that. I well, get sure. some satisfaction from that, and also just knowing that it's absolutely fresh and so on. But how much you're willing to pay for those satisfactions is, of course, an individual decision. But w- w- do you counsel people on this? Well, I do, and my attitude is very similar to yours. Now, the you know the new car smell, if you will, the you know nobody has soiled it, nobody's been in it. You're the first person to pull the plastic off the seats. That's an intangible, and you have to decide for yourself whether it's worth it to you to spend that amount of money uh, to to get that. Um, from a purely objective and rational point of view, um, the fact is that a lightly used uh, car, say three four years old, uh, will be a tremendous savings to you financially. Um, you know, they, uh, they typically depreciate anywhere from 30, 30% or more during that time. So think about that amount of money that you're saving. And meanwhile, uh, the longevity of, of the typical car today is Methuselian. Uh, it's entirely reasonable to expect to get uh, 150, 175,000 miles or more uh, out of the car before anything major begins to go wrong and cost you money. And so you buy a car with 30 or 40,000 miles on it, and it's, it's analogous to buying a car with, you know, 5,000 miles on it back in 1979. That's amazing. It is. That really is amazing. Now, is this, does that have anything to do whatsoever with government requirements, or does it have to do with just the natural quality improvement that tends to occur on the market? Well, I'll have to give the devil his due. Um, there is a federal law requiring that all of the emissions equipment that a new car comes with must maintain its uh, functionality for 10 years, 100,000 miles. The legal requirement, the automakers are required under warranty uh, to fix any part of the vehicle's emission system that fails before then. Um, so, you know, purely out of the motivation to avoid having to spend a bunch of money, they have engineered their cars to be more durable uh, for that reason. But I, I kind of think that it's, it's a moot point because the market would have demanded, just in, as in any other product, that they get better and better. Uh, you know, people would not have put up with cars that began to burn oil and smoke and become reliable, unreliable at 70,000 miles. They would have expected the cars to get better and better and better, and they would have done that without the government. So it's it's really it, – it's kind of a non sequitur in my opinion. All right. Give people your 30-second pitch for epautos.com. Well, if you're uh, a gearhead and if you're a libertarian, if you like cars, if you like bikes – 
uh, you know, come on down. We have a lot of really good people there, not just me, um, going back and forth about all of these topics that you and I have been discussing, as well as a bunch of other topics, including political topics. And it, as you say, it's a it's a ton of fun to read. It is a good community of people. It's a take that, as you noted earlier, is is unique in this area. There there aren't very many uh, Eric Peters out there, which in a way is good for you, but bad for the it's world. Shocking. Yeah, it is it, shocking. It surprises the heck out of me because, you know, when I was a kid and I read all of the, they, we call them buff books, the, you know, the, the enthusiast publications, the car and drivers and road and tracks, all those guys were like me. They loved the cars. They had passion for it. They wanted to go fast. They, you know, they were interested in the sex appeal of it. And mostly that just seems to have gone by the wayside. And, and the guys out there who are writing about cars, you know, they'll tell you how many airbags the car has. Uh, you know, they'll tell you whether it has collision avoidance technology and things like that. You know, shoot me now, please. Um, just, you know, I want, I want to have fun. I want to have a good time. I'm not interested in airbags. Yeah, see, again, you would think like people who are inter- in, into uh, gun ownership, well, they tend to have certain views about other topics. And, uh, you know, there are some people – I mean there are some – Techie people, you can see having uh, some libertarian views, and and uh, I have a friend who's who's in marketing, and he says marketers tend to be libertarians, and I, you would think car aficionados would be one of these, right? I mean, the car represents independence. How weird is it? I imagine if guns and ammo, for example, you know, in reviewing uh, the latest Glock or Kimber, uh, focused almost entirely uh, on how well the thing fit into a gun safe and had a trigger lock. Yeah, yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> Exactly. It would be like that ad for the, the the salsa on TV when they're sitting around and they can't believe the salsa they're eating was made in New York City. New York City. <laughs> exactly. Yep, I remember that. Yeah. The classic. Yes. <laughs> get out. Yeah, of it's just it's bizarre. All right. Well, listen. Now we're going to get all the real red blooded uh, car lovers over to epautos.com to read what you're doing and equally as importantly to support what you're doing. I mean, you 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 are the one guy. Let's get over there and support the one guy. Uh, until next time, uh, Eric, a pleasure talking to you, and thanks so much. Thanks, Tom. Always enjoy it. All right, everybody. TomWoods.com slash 627 is the show notes page for today. I'll have a few items that uh, we talked about today, and I'll have a link to epautos.com in case you forget it. But I promised you a freebie at the end, and if you listen to episode 626, at the end of that episode, I gave you a way to text to get a free course on the presidents, not taught the way your seventh grade teacher taught you about the presidents, where they were all demigods and where would we be without them, but a realistic look at the presidents and how crummy all their programs were, to the contrary. So this course which comes from my libertyclassroom.com, is 22 videos long, and I'm giving it away for free. You don't even have to be a member of Liberty Classroom to enjoy it. 22 videos, 22 audio files so you can listen on the go, plus a complete bibliography of books on the presidents that you can actually trust, these books. And you can get it not only by texting the word president to 44222, but if it's easier for you, you can simply check out free history course Dot com. And at freehistorycourse.com, you will be able to sign up to get your login information to access this course. I hope you enjoy it. It's by Brian McClanahan, who's been a guest on this show. And you're going to learn a lot about the presidents that you didn't learn in school, and that's what this show is all about. So go enjoy freehistorycourse.com, and I'll see you tomorrow. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit TomWoods.com to subscribe to the show for free, and we'll see you next time.